Greetings everybody, it's me, your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete, and this is my series, Nails in a Coffin, where we learn that with great kills, they must also come great nails. So, welcome to my channel, or welcome back to my channel. We're over a month in uh, covering the Puppet Master franchise, and today we're going to nail Curse of the Puppet Master. Here's a look at the average Nails in a Coffin for all the movies I've covered so far. And as you can see, Puppet Master 5 currently has the lowest average nails on a coffin with only 1.13 nails. If you watched some of my previous videos since I've been covering this Puppet Master franchise, you'll know that something or someone has been messing with me. And I'm not really sure... Crap. Okay, um, that was close. And hopefully that's all I'll be dealing with today. So let's continue on with the video, why don't we? Curse of the Puppet Master is a direct sequel to the original Puppet Master, ignoring parts 2 through 5. Charles Band actually said that this movie was going to be a standalone in the franchise. The plot revolves around a scientist who's attempting to master the art of transferring people's souls into puppets. But before we get started, if you wouldn't mind, please hitting that subscribe button. It'll go a long way in keeping me motivated to make these videos. I do have a you know lofty goal of hitting 500 subscribers by April 1st, and I think I can do it. If you know you would hit that subscribe button, share this video around, help me grow this channel because I'm still having fun making it, and I do I do love making this content, and it'd be very awesome if you could help me out on this journey. So. Thanks again. Hopefully you'll consider doing that. I really do appreciate it. So let's get down to business, sit back, relax, and enjoy as we put some nails in a coffin with Curse of the Puppet Master. When the movie begins, we're at Dr. McGrew's House of Marvels. He is currently in possession of Andre Toulon's Foot Locker and along with the puppets that were inside of it. And he is currently their master. They're all in cages watching him stuff something into a box. And he's telling the puppets, hey, it's going to be different next time. Dr. McGrew then leaves with the box and he drives to a secluded spot in the woods. He picks a spot, digs a hole in the ground, and then he places the box in the hole, pours gasoline all over the box as well as all over his feet. Um, he then strikes a match, sets the box on fire, and then the, the whole time while this was happening, the box was shaking, and you could kind of hear muffled sounds coming from inside. The next day, McGrew is having lunch with his daughter Jane, and she's asking him how work is going. He's talking to her about what she's been doing in college, how she's in, enjoying it. And then Jane asks McGrew how his assistant Matt has been doing. And Matt, uh, excuse me, Dr. McGrew says Matt had to leave because his father was ill. But Dr. McGrew was kind of acting a little sketchy about why Matt had to really leave. And Jane said that she thought Matt liked working for her father. And he tells her, you know, he did like, but sometimes people change and you can never predict how. Kind of sketchy. I wonder if that has anything to do with the box that was set on fire. Nah, probably got nothing to do with it. So McGrew and Jane decide to take a drive to take their mind off things. And when they arrive at the gas station, they see the town tough guy Joey and his friends bullying Robert, who currently works at the gas station. Robert is a very tall but timid young man, and he goes by the nickname Tank. He actually has a hobby of carving small wooden statues. Jane comes to defend Tank, and then Joey starts in with her. Dr. Maru comes over tells Joey to pretty much F off. And Jane was talking to Tank because she kind of likes the statues that Robert was uh, carving and she compliments him on them. She then shows him to her father who introduces himself to Tank. And upon, upon seeing the carving, um, he's impressed with Tank's uh, abilities and he offers him a job with his show. And Tank, of course, is going to accept the offer and they all go back to McGrew's house. Back in McGrew's house, Robert is introduced to Andre Toulon's puppets, and he's very much impressed by this. He's actually amazed that these puppets are alive, as pretty much anybody would be. So, Dr. McGrew actually tells Robert that he bought these puppets at an auction, but he can't quite replicate what Andre Toulon was able to accomplish with his puppets. So, over dinner, Dr. McGrew was telling Robert that he wants him to carve a puppet for him, and this is actually what his previous assistant, Matt, would do for him. During one of the puppet shows that McGrew is putting on, he actually gets questioned by local law enforcement about the disappearance about his former assistant, Matt. 
The doctor tells him that he hasn't seen Matt since he left and he doesn't know what could have happened to him. And you can tell the cops here really aren't really picking up what Dr. McGrew is saying. They really aren't too sure if they should be believing him at this point. Robert, he's been working on his carvings for Dr. McGrew, but he's also having nightmares the past couple of nights. In one of his recent nightmares, he dreams that he has carved puppet parts inside of him and they look like the inner workings of a clock. The next day, Jane and Robert take a break and they go drive into the woods, probably for a picnic. So while walk, walking towards a clearing, you know, that Jane wanted to show Robert, they find a half burnt box that Dr. McGrew, you know, had set a fire at the beginning of the movie. Robert bends down to look at it and he reaches in and pulls out a small carved wooden hand. But he goes to go show it to Jane, but she was walking away. Joey and his friends were hanging out in the woods. I guess that's just what they do. They run into Jane and Joey starts to harass her. He won't let her leave. Jane starts to get angry. She tries to push past Joey. Joey's taking offense to this, I guess. And he actually starts to sexually harass her with all his friends. And I really want Joey to die screaming as painful as possible. Robert shows up and he tells Joey to stop. Of course, he's not going to listen. And he's actually starting to threaten to actually essay Jane. Robert's had enough. He slams him on the hood of Joey's car, grabs him around the throat, and starts to choke him. Jane was able to get Tank to stop choking Joey, and they go back to the woods while Joey was trying to regain his composure. It's now 45 minutes into the movie, and we're finally getting to our first kill. Joey, he was upset that Tank had choked, tried to choke him out, so he goes to McGrew's House of Marvels because he wanted to go beat up Tank, but when he gets there, he decides, hey, why don't I just assault Jane? I really want him to die. Pinhead tried to help Jane out, but Joey was able to break off his hand and he breaks his other arm and tosses him aside. Joey and Dr. McGrew show up and Joey was able to run off. Now, Dr. McGrew wants revenge, deservedly so, and he actually goes to Joey's house with Blade and Tunneler. Joey is now home lifting weights and the puppets are dropped off by Dr. McGrew with some really nice lighting. The puppets are slowly walking down the hallway approaching Joey. They get to Joey where he's lifting weights and Tunneler walks up to the end of the bench and Blade goes to the top by Joey's head. Joey sees Blade above him, but before he can do anything, Blade slashes him in the head. Joey sits up, grabbing his face, right as Tunneler turns on his drill, goes right into Joey's undercarriage, drilling inside of him, killing him in a very, very satisfying way. The first on-screen kill in Curse of the Puppet Master was Douchebag Joey, and guess what we're giving him? I think you and I both know. One now in the coffin. You know, his actions led to him getting killed since he broke into McGrew's House of Wonders with a plan to attack Tank and assault Jane. So he had this coming, but when Blade slashed him on his head, he did sit up and grab his face, but when he saw Tumbler by his crotch, he never jumped or moved out of the way. When the drill was going inside of him, he never tried to grab Tunneler and pull him out of him. He just kind of took it. He didn't get up and put up any much of a fight. He just, when he had the opportunity to do so. I think as, you, as, um, as soon as you felt something poke you down there, your instinct would have you jumping up and moving to get away from that as soon as possible. But Joey didn't do any of this. And of course, he's definitely going to deserve his one nail in the coffin. Robert has been sick the past couple of days, so Dr. McGrew plans on transferring his soul into a puppet. But before he can do so, Sheriff Garvey and Deputy Wayburn show up and they want to question the doctor about the death of Joey and Matt being missing. They walk into the House of Wonders with their guns drawn and horrible, horrible trigger discipline. They approach the doctor and start making threats, so the doctor sends his puppets after the officers. Six Shooter lap lassos Deputy Wayburn around his neck, and he's actually holding him down. Tunnler is actually now standing under the deputy's head with his drill spinning, and he drills right into the deputy's forehead, killing him. Deputy Idiot gets one nail in the coffin. It made no sense the way they had their guns drawn already with their fingers on the trigger to talk to the doctor. They had no evidence that he was guilty of anything. Joey's friends just said the last time they saw him, he was attacked by Tank, who was with Jane. So, Deputy Way Wayburn also forgot he had arms. The lasso went around his throat and pulled him down, but then he was able to turn around, so the lasso was at the back of his neck. It wasn't choking him anymore. His arms were still free, and he just let Tunneler drill right into his forehead. He could have pulled him away, could have tried to knock Tunneler away, but he didn't do anything. 
It's very common in this Puppet Master franchise. People forget they have arms. And this was a sad example of law enforcement. He was stupid, and as Warren is lucky, he's only going to get his one nail in the coffin. While the deputy was getting drilled, Sheriff Garvey was stabbed in the leg by a blade, and he falls to the floor and drops his gun. The sheriff is dragging himself along the floor with Blade slowly approaching. The sheriff looks up, sees Jester, who slashes him in the face. Blade then jumps on top of the sheriff and he starts to slash and stab the sheriff in his face while Dr. McGrew is laughing the entire time and Blade is cutting this fool up until he eventually dies. Just like his partner, this moron is going to get one now in the coffin. And it's pretty much the same reason as the deputy. He was stabbed in the leg, but he acted like his leg was cut off. He couldn't have gone back to his feet and limped or just hopped on one leg to get away. He also forgot he had arms as well. He could have covered up when Blade was slashing at him. He could have tried to grab the puppet and throw him. He could have done something, but no. These two morons deserve to die. Their procedures were crap. The worst trigger discipline I've seen in a movie. And they were easy to kill because they both forgot they had arms and they were stupid. Yeah, it was easy for them. So Sheriff Garvey earned himself a solid one now in the coffin. Jane has been a little suspicious of her father's experiments. And she goes back to the burnt box in the woods and she finds something that was in the box. She picks it up and she knows it's actually one of Matt's carvings. It starts to speak and says her name in Matt's voice. She freaks out and throws the puppet down to the ground and she knows that her father, well, she knows what her father is about to do, so she rushes back home. While back at the house, Dr. McGrew has Tank strapped to a table, planning to put his soul into a puppet. He starts his experiment and his electrical bolt connects Tank to this specially made puppet. Eventually, Tank does vaporize and his soul and everything goes inside to this new puppet, which happens to be a Tank. Get it? The puppets get pissed since they really like Tank and they didn't want Tank's soul to be transferred into a puppet. Blade looks at McGrew and he does the Undertaker throat slash. Blade starts to walk towards the doctor who knows that he pretty much effed up. Blade slashes at his legs. McGrew picks up a wooden hammer but he drops it. He falls to the floor like 90% of the kills in this franchise. Blade gets on top of the doctor and starts slashing the hell out of the doctor's face and neck. Tunneler drills into his leg. Pinhead smashes him with the cane. Jane arrives shortly thereafter and she finds her father nearly dead on the floor covered in blood. He looks up at her and says, I did it. Well then Tank is awake and he zaps the doctor in the forehead, killing him and ending the movie. Dr. McGrew was last to get killed in this movie. Not a lot of kills, only four of them, but I think you're all going to agree with me. He deserves one now in the coffin. He didn't care about anybody else's life. You know, when he messed up trying to transfer his former assistant, Soul Matt, into a puppet, it didn't work, so he burned it alive. And he didn't care about Tank either. You know, he knew what the puppets were capable of, and he just backed away from Blade when Blade, you know, did the Undertaker throat slash. And just like all of Blade's kills, um, he slashes somebody's leg, and they fall down acting like their feet and their legs were cut off. Blade gets on top of him, slashes at his face, again... He never used his arms to cover up or do anything to throw in the puppet. Like, all the times Blade kills somebody. And Blade, yeah, he's my favorite puppet so far. But damn, people make it so easy when he kills them. Um, yeah, the Doctor really didn't put up much of a fight or anything. He was stupid. It was way too easy to kill him. So, he's going to get one now in the coffin. By the way, what the hell's going to happen to Matt? You know, he was turned into a puppet only for the experiment to go wrong. It didn't work. He was then burned alive, and he obviously didn't kill him because he was still trying to get help. His boss's daughter finds him. He gasps her for help. She screams and throws him to the ground, and we never find out what happened to Matt. Like, where is he now? It's really kind of dark when you think about what's going on with Matt. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Those are all my nails in a coffin for Curse of the Puppet Master. Here's a summary of all the nails I've awarded. Here's the average nails in a coffin for all the movies I've covered so far. So, after six movies, you can see that Curse of the Puppet Master has the lowest average with only one nail in the coffin. And the MVP for this week is Blade. He killed the sheriff, he killed Dr. McGrew, and when he did kill the doctor, he more or less acted like the leader of the puppets. He kind of looked like he was telling everybody what to go do. And he also helped kill Joey. He was easily, in this movie, the standout puppet for me. 
earning himself the MVP. And this is actually Blade's second award as MVP for the Puppet Master franchise. Thanks again for watching. I hope you liked this video. I had fun making it. I hope you consider hitting that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And share this video around. Help me grow this channel. That would be awesome. I will see you here next week when I cover Retro Puppet Master. Which takes place after part 3 but before part 1. But has flashbacks to when Andre Toulon was really young. If you haven't seen it, you'll see it. Uh, so I'll see you here next week for that. I just have to make it to next week. I just need to keep an eye out for you know who up there. Um, so take care, everybody. Stay safe. Be good to each other. I am your friendly neighborhood, Uncle Pete. And remember, with great kills, there must also come great nails.